Well, we welcome you today. And uh, man, how about Time Change Sunday? Are you guys awake? Yeah, I know you lost an hour, but man, to get in here in the presence of God and get your blood pumping a little bit, you know, it feels good, doesn't it? Yeah, there we go. Robert's excited. Come on. Somebody in the house has got to keep up with Robert this morning because I know he's excited. Robert's excited every Sunday. It's good. Well, I got a question for you. How is your faith? How's your faith? Is it strong? Is it weak? Is it dynamic? Is it growing? Or do you have like a little snaggletooth-like type of faith that's barely hanging on? How's your faith? The Bible tells us that, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. We got to have faith. We got to have faith. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. And uh, the Bible also tells us in the same chapter, according uh, to your faith, or everything is possible for him who has faith. So Faith is so important. You can't live without faith. we got to have faith. And faith is like a muscle. It grows. It grows. And God puts us at seasons in our lives on the bench press of faith, where our faith is starting to grow. Those muscles are getting ripped. We have to exercise the muscle of faith to see the, the muscle develop. And God wants us to have faith. And most people live inside of a box. And when I say inside of a box, I mean most people live, the average person lives with very little faith. And when you live without faith, you live inside of a box. All you see is what you see, and all you see is what you can do, and you have a very limited perspective. God wants us to be people of faith, and people of faith live outside the box. And to live outside the box means to live outside the norm. It means to think of things from a different vantage point. And that vantage point comes from God. When you have faith, you begin to look at your circumstances and your life and your scenarios in a totally different way. Uh, We see things that, uh, we see new possibilities. We see things from uh, unconventional perspectives, all with the eye of faith. That's why it's so exciting to be in relationship with with Jesus Christ. Well, in Hebrews chapter 11, the theme of that chapter of Scripture is living by faith. And in Hebrews chapter 11, we have a whole list of all of these great heroes from the Old Testament and how they live by faith. Today, I want to turn our attention to one of those individuals. But before we get to that, Hebrews 11.1 says this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things that are not seen. And uh, simply put, the Bible is saying to us that faith is trusting in someone that you cannot see or that you don't totally understand. See, to live by faith means that you don't have all of the answers, you don't know exactly what what is going on, but but you're trusting in the Lord. It's not just what is seen, it is also what what is not seen, and you have to see some things with the eye of faith before you will begin to see things in reality. So that that faith muscle has got to be exercised. Today we're going to exercise, we're going to build our our faith muscles, if you will, by looking at a couple scriptures related to to having this outside-the-box faith. I love 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Uh, Paul said, the apostle, we live by faith and not by sight. You know, you want to have a great life, you want to have a dynamic life, you cannot live by just what you see. You have to live by faith. And I love from the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 2, or verse 12, a prayer that I have prayed for myself many times. Uh, This is Jehoshaphat, he's the king, and he's praying this, For we have no power to face the vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Is that not a great passage? God, I don't know what's going on, but my eyes are on you. God, I don't know why this happened, but my eyes are on you. God, I don't know what the future is, but my eyes are on you. That's what living by faith is all about. It's not about having all of the answers, but it's about keeping our eyes on the one who does. And we say, show and I'll believe. And in reality, God says, believe and then we will see. Now, faith is not just positive thinking. Some people think if you're just positive that you have faith. Faith is in a person and his name is God. Faith is in a person. So faith is not just being positive. It's not just a hunch. It's not just being optimistic. Okay, you can be optimistic and not have faith in your life. Faith is confidence in the Lord. 
Faith is confidence when you don't know what's going on. You can trust in the Lord. That's what faith is all about. And, and that's why it's so important for us to build uh, our faith. We've been in a season that we started last week, a series of messages where Edge Church's faith is growing and growing and growing. And I tell you, one of the blessings about being in a dynamic church that is growing and expanding and doing great things for God is that you will begin to see parallels in your own personal life as you see the church advance and take territory for the kingdom of God. And when you begin to see God bless the church, you'll begin to think, well, maybe God could bless me. You know, maybe what I've saw over there on Sunday, maybe the Lord could do that in my life. And I know you're going to be encouraged as you see our church continue to develop and take these steps of faith. I'm encouraged. And uh, I tell you, after we kicked off last week our Shake the City uh, project, I was just reminded of how much I love Edge Church. I just love this church. Do you guys love this church? Yeah. I mean, yeah, put your hands together. It's good. We need to be reminded of that. And uh, we are a five-and-a-half-year-old church. We have an opportunity to own one of the largest church buildings in this part of town, and we are working on that. And that's what our Shake the City project is, is focusing us on living by faith in such a way that we can purchase this building soon. That's our goal. We've been leasing this property, but, but we believe that God wants us to own it. We've been renting the house, and now we want to become owners. And, and in doing that, we believe we're going to shake the city. We're going to shake the city. And last week, we talked about how we're praying that God would shake us so that we could shake the city. And that's what the Shake the City Project is all about. It's really centered around Matthew chapter 21, verse 10, when Jesus rides into the city of Jerusalem, and the Bible says that the city was shaken. The city was shaken. You know what? When Jesus is exalted, things start to shake. Have you noticed that? Things start to shake in your own life. Things start to shake in the church. Things start to shake everywhere that we turn. When we begin to lift up Jesus, things begin to shake. That's why when Jesus was crucified and resurrected, there was an earthquake. God was sending a message. Things are shaking because Jesus is being exalted. Jesus is being exalted. Well, the, the, the hero of faith we want to look at today is found in Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 4. And the Bible tells us it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. And Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. And although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. And so in Hebrews 11, we've got this whole list of all of these great heroes of the Old Testament that live by faith, and the very first one is Abel. Now, we've heard of Moses and Noah and Gideon and those guys. Sometimes we haven't heard of Abel as much, but he's the first guy on the list. So we got to talk about Abel because Abel did something that has been recorded for thousands of years as, as an act of faith. And he brought this amazing offering to God that, we find here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, uh, Abel is actually the brother of Cain, Cain and Abel. Maybe you've heard of Cain and Abel. It's right here from the Bible. Genesis chapter 4 is where Hebrews 11, 4 is referencing. And uh, many think that Cain and Abel were maybe twin brothers. We're not totally sure. They were, they were at least brothers, but they might have been twins. But Cain was the older, and Cain was a farmer, and Abel was the younger brother, and he was a shepherd. And I was reading in my Bible this week, and it had the little subscript above the section of Scripture, and it said, Cain kills his brother Abel. And if you read on into the story, we know that Cain was jealous of his brother, and he took his brother's life. And a lot of times when we think of Cain and Abel, we think about Cain murdering his little brother Abel. But you know what? When we do that, we actually miss a beautiful part of the story. Because the story is not just about Cain killing his brother Abel. The story really is about this amazing offering that Abel brought to the Lord. That's what the story is about. And then unfortunately, Cain, the older brother, was jealous of the younger brother and took his life. But if we just think about the murder that took place, we really miss what was going on in the passage. And you notice in Hebrews 11, 4, it says that Cain's gift showed that he was approved by God and that God was pleased with it. And Abel was a normal guy. Love to point this out. Abel was a normal guy, but he had an extraordinary faith. 
See, he was just a he was just a normal dude. He was just a little rancher guy, you know? Nothing special about Abel. And you know what? If Abel can have extraordinary faith, I believe you can too. I believe that we can too. We can be people of of extraordinary faith and just be normal people. Sometimes we have this idea that all these Bible guys, you know, like, oh, I can never be like them. Hey, Abel's a normal guy. He never did any miracles. He never walked on the water. You know, he, 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 never, he never marched around the walls of Jericho and, 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 and saw him fall down. Abel's just, he's just a rancher. He's just kind of a country guy, you know. And, and yet he had an extraordinary faith. So it's an encouragement to us. So let's talk about how we can live outside the box with our faith. And the first thing we see here in Hebrews 11, 4 is, I live outside the box by giving generously. <clears throat> it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. And if you bounce to Genesis 4, we see the same story with a little more detail. But when it was time for the harvest, verse 3, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord, and Abel brought a gift, the best portions, of the firstborn lambs from his flock, and the Lord accepted Abel and his gifts. And biblical commentators tell us that the emphasis here in the Hebrew language is that, that, that Abel brought a sacrificial portion to God, but Cain just brought kind of what was left over, just kind of what was laying around the house, maybe what he had that was extra, what he had that nobody else wanted, uh, something that didn't really cost him anything. He brought that to God. God was disappointed with Cain, but God was pleased with Abel because notice it says here, Abel brought the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. And uh, this is a foreshadowing of what the Jewish people are going to practice uh, for, for many, many years. But the first, the firstborn uh, was always given to God. So if you got a mama lamb and mama lamb gives birth to the first baby, the first baby goes to God and then the other lambs you can keep. <clears throat> and, and this was a picture of the tithe that was, that, that's coming forth here in, in this passage and other passages where God gets the first. The first portion belongs to God. We give to God first. And God was pleased with what Abel did because he brought the first portions, and I love the NIV. The NIV version says he brought the fat portions. How many of you like that? I'm like, the fat portions. I love it. When I go over to Jim and Nick's, I always order extra lean, you know. I don't like the fat portions, but God does. God loves. The, everybody say fat portions. Fat portions. Yeah, he loves the fat portions. The fat belongs to God. Fat means big and good. Fat means good. And uh, it's interesting that the very first uh, example of faith in Hebrews 11, and there's a bunch of guys mentioned there, but the very first one is about giving. Isn't that interesting? The very one is the very first one is about generosity. Because God knows that perhaps the greatest area of faith in our lives is with our money. We got more stress and more anxiety about our finances than anything else, most people, most people. And so God puts forth this example of Abel, and he says, listen, when you are struggling with your faith, when you are struggling with your finances, when you're struggling believing God, look at the example of Abel who, who pleased God by bringing these, these fat portions. Now, Abel's offering was not necessarily bigger but it was considered better by God because it was sacrificial. It wasn't about the amount, it was about the heart. And Cain has this religious spirit. You know what a religious spirit is when it comes to giving? I'm going to give because I'm going to feel guilty if I don't. That's Cain. I'm giving under obligation. I'm giving because I'm going to feel bad if I don't. Abel, Abel on the other hand, he's saying, God, I'm excited, man. I'm this is opportunity, you know? What a privilege. This is an act of worship. Let me bring God the, the fat portions, the fat portions. And this is, a, this is about faith. And here we are in the middle of our Shake the City project. We're asking our members and attenders to give over and above their normal tithes, over 
a 36 month period to help us purchase this building. And in doing that, um, we are asking not for equal amounts, but equal sacrifice. You know, everybody in this room will make a different contribution. Everybody will, will, will make a different size contribution. Some will be larger, some will be smaller. That's not what matters to God. What matters to God is, is, is equal sacrifice. And that's why God was pleased with Abel and he wasn't pleased with Cain because Abel made a sacrifice, but Cain did not. He did not. How did Abel give? Well, he did so in faith. He did so in faith. And he brought those fat portions. And uh, one commentator said about the, the offering of Cain, it was probably damaged or extra or leftovers. It's kind of the emphasis here. Uh, unlike his brother. Now, I love to eat uh, guacamole. Do we have any guacamole fans in the house? I love that. You know, I get so fired up when Walmart puts those, puts those avocados on sale three for a dollar. Please send me a tweet or something like that when, that when that happens. I love that. But you know what? When you buy avocados three for a dollar, you better eat them quickly because there is a reason that they are on sale for three for a dollar because they're not long for this earth. You know what I'm saying? One time I bought them three for a dollar and I set them there for a week and I, I was a little surprised when I opened, when I opened them up. Yeah. When I read this example of Cain, I think Cain brought avocados that were three for a dollar to God. That's what he did, the moldy stuff. The smelly strawberries and the moldy tomatoes and all that. God, I was going to throw these out today anyway. Here, I'll just go ahead and give these to you, you know. The Bible says God wasn't pleased. And there's some foods that taste terrible left over. How about leftover sushi? Anybody here ever had leftover sushi? That's disgusting. How about leftover croutons? All soggy and nasty. I have never had a leftover french fry that ever tasted good. Try that sometime. Go get you some Chick-fil-A french fries. I know they're not open on Sundays, but <laughs> go get you some of those. Put those in the refrigerator and pull them out and try and eat. That didn't work. That didn't work very well. did not work. Some foods just don't taste good left over. And uh, I, I tell you, I, I hate life leftovers. My wife's trying to teach me to eat leftovers. I do not like it. I like it fresh and hot. I don't know about you guys. Anybody hate leftovers? Here in the house. People have phobias of leftovers. I got, I got phobias of that stuff. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh, several years ago, Gina was going to go to a baby shower, and she said, Ryan, the brownies are in the oven, and I need you to take them out, and I'm going to go take a shower and get ready for, for the baby shower, and then uh, I'll see you in a few minutes. Can you handle that? I was like, I got it. I got my assignment. Well, the timer went off. I pulled the brownies out, and I smelled of the brownies, and I was like, man, these brownies smell good. So I let him cool down for a couple of minutes, and I thought, man, that was so nice of my wife to make some brownies, you know? And I went and helped myself, and I had like a big chunk of brownie like that. Well, Gina came down. She was ready to go to the baby shower, and she said, who ate one of the brownies? And I said, well, uh, I just went ahead and helped myself to a little bit of that, and, and I thought it wasn't that big a deal because you were just going to feed all those other people, you know, at the shower. And I thought I might as well have some. And she said, Ryan, this looks like I'm bringing leftovers to the shower. That's bad etiquette. I'm like, I'm a man, you know, don't you dare put some gluten-free brownies in front of me, you know? <laughs> be all over those. Yeah, how weird would it be if you invited somebody over to your house um, for Thanksgiving dinner and when they got there, you started pulling all this stuff out of the fridge. You had pizza from Tuesday night, you had a chicken breast from Wednesday night, you had spaghetti from Saturday night, and you just started warming it. I mean, what would you communicate to the person? You'd kind of say, like, you're not that important, are you? When you have, when you have a, a guest of honor, what do you do? Man, it's Thanksgiving, you bust out the finest plates that you've got, you bring out the, the, the best silverware that you have, you bring the cloth napkins instead of the wet wipes, Right? I mean, you know, you, you dress up a little bit. My mom used to always want me to wear a tie and a vest at Thanksgiving dinner, and I'm like, Mom, I'm just going down the hallway. She's like, but it's Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving. You've got you to gotta, you gotta dress up, you know, and you spend all day cooking the meal because it's a big deal. And then when you have uh, guests that are there, the person of honor, 
the person of honor always gets the first helping, don't they? Yeah, it would be inappropriate for me to cook all this food and say, all you suckers can get behind me, I'm going to get the first portion. You let the person of honor or the people of honor, you let them go first, and then you, you fend for all the scraps, all the stuff that's left over, right? Because that's, that's what's appropriate. Now, in the life of Cain, Cain is bringing God his leftover brownies. He's bringing God kind of like this big cake, but he's eating, you know, half of it. God, here, here's, here's what you got. And this is the difference between Cain and Abel. Isn't it amazing that you could have two brothers that are from the exact same family, <clears throat> and they have two totally different perspectives? Have you ever met people before, and you're like, I can't even believe you guys are siblings, you know? Have you ever looked at your own family and said, I can't believe I'm related to them? <laughs> Cain and Abel, two totally different dudes, two totally different outcomes. <clears throat> Gina had an opportunity to talk with one of our families that uh, played a significant role in helping us uh, move into this building. And they have since moved, and Gina talked to them this week, and they said we could share their story of faith. And I wanted to share this with you because this is one of the great faith stories that I've, I've heard about our church. Um, <clears throat> we were uh, in the middle of doing our REACH project, which... We did a couple of years ago for all of you new people to help us raise some money to move into a, a more permanent facility. And ultimately, that building was here. At the time, we didn't know that, but it led us to, to move into this, to this campus. And this family, um, what, it, was, it was the day that everybody was going to make their pledges on what they were going to give over the next two years. And the, the husband really felt led by God to do $20,000 over, over two years. And the wife said, I keep the books. I think we need to do ten. <laughs> And so they were kind of going back and forth during the time of commitment, trying to figure out, you know, what they needed to do. And, uh, of course, we didn't know any of this until just, you know, really uh, recently. All the details, we knew a little bit of it after all this happened. But uh, so there's, there's a difference. They end up committing $10,000 over, over two years. And the very next day, the very next day, they get a check in the mail. And guess how much that check's for? It's for $10,000. Yes, yeah, for ten thousand dollars, it's the it's the exact amount that they they had pledged, and um, the wife called me crying. Actually, I thought somebody had died, you know. And she's like, "No, this is good," you know. And um, she said, "Ryan, we got a check for ten thousand dollars. It's from the company that my husband worked for previously, and uh, we had moved twice, and we were supposed to get this check six weeks ago, but we got it this day." And she said, "Had we gotten it?" A few days before, I think we would have just given this $10,000, and that would have been our commitment to the REACH project, and we would have been done with it. But she said, you know what? Since we've really been praying about it and thinking about it, we feel like that God wants it to us to up our pledge to $20,000, and we're going to give this 10 now, and then we're going to give the other 10 like we had planned. And they said, we want to take, but this is a step of faith for us. And in order to, to give that other $10,000, and I just heard this this week this was something I did not even know but they they made some big sacrifices they they decided to uh they the the mom said that she did the kids haircuts in the house uh the the mom didn't go get manicures and pedicures you know that's sacrificing for Jesus by the way okay <laughs> You're putting that on the line I know you love Jesus <laughs> come on <clears throat> and um they didn't go out to eat as much and they just really made some sacrifices you know what, that money played a significant role uh, to get us into this facility. And other people in our church made sacrifices too. And you know, I love this story because God convicts every family a little bit differently. You know, it's not the same for everybody. Everybody's different. God may speak to you about something differently than he did this other family. That doesn't matter. What we're trying to do is we're trying to hear from God. We're trying to hear from God. God, what are you, what are you saying? How could I bring an offering like, like Abel and not like Cain? And what does that mean? What does that mean? And uh, uh, God, how could I bring the, the fat portions? I know uh, I was laughing about this with Gina. Um, this is actually our uh, fifth project to be involved in. And... Uh, I've led four, this is the fourth project I've led. We've been involved in five projects that we've given money to. And so I, I have this, this old Toyota 4Runner. And I keep calling that like my building project car. Because 
because, because I've had this old car and I keep driving it and I do have to lay hands on it and anoint it with oil sometimes to get it to run. But you know what, instead of buying a new car, I've used some of the money that I would have really liked to buy a new car and I'm gonna have to at some point. But, but I've been able to use that money for these projects to give to God for projects. It's, it's a sacrifice that we've made, but you know what, in the grand scheme of things, it's really not that big a deal what kind of car that I drive. And I'm, I'm good with driving my car. But if God gives me another one, that's fine too. But in the meantime, it's working great because I don't have that payment. And that payment is helping us make sacrifices to invest in kingdom and in project. I think this is the heart of Abel. Abel gave with an open heart, not with a clenched hand. That's what God wants us to do. And when we live outside the box, we, we give generously. We bring those fat portions to God. Uh, there's a second thing we see here today. When we live outside the bo box, we walk in righteousness. And righteousness is just kind of a big fancy word that means to live in right standing with God. And so Abel's offering, verse 4, gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. It, you know, our faith has evidence. If you, if you say that you have faith, your life will give evidence of your faith. James says... The book of James says you can't just say that you have faith and you don't have any works because your works will show your faith. And in Abel and Cain's situation, Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man. So when we walk with God, when we walk in spiritual maturity, we can see that reflected in the spirit of generosity that we have. And part of living a life in right standing with God is being generous. Now money can have power over us, but you know what? Money can also give power to us. And God has given every person in this room some resources. And when resources are leveraged together for kingdom purposes, guess what? There's power. There's power that comes for that. And there is power behind our generosity and our giving. So money can have power over us, but it can also give power to us. And we want to use the power that God has given to us to maximize kingdom and his investment and we live outside the box when we walk in righteousness when we develop that heart of generosity uh, giving does stuff for me not just for others and the church you know that now we're talking a lot about others and that's a big part of the shake the city project is others 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 but i will tell you when you put your life out on the line when you live by faith god will stretch you your heart for god will become stronger you will begin to believe God for things that you did not know were possible. So it teaches us to live by faith. And when we give sacrificially, we always learn and grow. We always learn and grow. Every single time. Every project Gina and I have given to, we have always grown. God has always blessed us spiritually. And you know what? God has blessed us financially as well. I can tell you that. So we live by faith. Uh, it also breaks the control of materialism on us because we all have this fatal attraction where we love stuff and sometimes if we're not careful our love for stuff can get in the way of our love for God but you know what giving and being generous rids us of materialism it also makes me happy you know the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver so when we give cheerfully uh, it brings joy to us and it shows God that I love him so there's a lot of great things walking in righteousness when we walk in righteousness, when we walk in right standing with God, there's so many faith benefits that come by developing that spirit of generosity. Number three is I live outside the box by pleasing God. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man and God showed his approval of his gifts. Here's the great thing. When we give sacrificially and generously, what happens? God is pleased. God is pleased. What a, what a great blessing right there. It makes God happy. God's like, man, I'd love to see them do that. God was, God was inspired by the gift of Abel. It was pleasing to God. We want to live lives that are pleasing to God. And we have an opportunity to do that. And uh, the Shake the City Project is about maximizing our ability to please God. It really is. Here's the fourth thing. I love this. I live outside the box by leaving a legacy. By leaving a legacy. Look at this in verse 4. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. 
And I'm about to get excited and say amen on that because I'll tell you what, when I start preparing sermons, I start reading the passage and when there's certain words or phrases that kind of jump off of the page to me, yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to preach on that. Abel's life continued to, to, to communicate a message beyond his death. Even though he was dead, he still spoke. How amazing is that, that we could be on this earth for, I don't know, however many more years, 10, 20, 30, 50 more years, whatever it is. But you know what? Through our generosity, we can still speak. We can still speak. We can still send a message. We can be long gone. You know what? People can say, there's a great gospel teaching church right there in Aurora, Colorado, Centennial, Colorado, on Smoky Hill Road. And you know what? Even though the people may be dead, the message still speaks. See, we still speak even after we're gone. That's called legacy. It's called legacy. We have opportunity to leave legacy. And four out of five churches in America are declining or are plateaued. See, we have an opportunity to be one of that 80% of churches that is advancing and growing. What an opportunity. What a privilege. I think if Abel could sit in this auditorium today, he would say to us, your giving still speaks. Your giving still speaks. Bring the fat portions to God, he would say. Bring it. And I was talking with somebody this week about the rate of return rate of return they were telling me they were they had purchased a piece of land from a company that's done all this research and after seven to ten years the amount of money that they invested into this land is the land's going to be worth somewhere between a hundred to two hundred times more than what it's worth today and they said Ryan it, there's a great rate of return and I started thinking about that in light of our shake the city project guess what guys there's going to be an amazing rate of return here at Edge Church. Because if we have already seen 750 people commit their lives to Jesus in the first five years, and we did that the hard way over at the stinky school, what could God do in the next five years? What could he do in the next 10 years? What could he do in the next 20 years? There, there's an amazing rate of return. The rate of return. And though we're dead, we'll still be speaking. I love that. It's a high-yield investment. The truth is we are all sitting in somebody else's sacrifice. Did you know that? Yeah. Our church members, years before, they sacrificed to get us to this level. Other churches, as a startup church, sacrifice. In fact, I was thinking today of the church that actually bought these chairs for us. It's a church in Lakewood. They gave us the money to buy these chairs. You are sitting in somebody else's sacrifice. And here's the, here's the opportunity we have. We have the opportunity to let other people sit in our sacrifice now. Isn't that great? That's what we do. I, I'm reminded of the parable of the talents. You may be thinking, well, how much should I commit to the Shake the City project? Here's a great picture of, of, of what we're talking about. The parable of the talents, Jesus tells a story about three servants. The master has five talents, and a talent is, is a measure of money. It's, 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 it's a certain unit of, of resources. So he gives five talents. He gives five pieces of money to the first servant, and then he gives two pieces of money, two talents to the second service, and he gives one to the third. And then the servants go away, and guess what? The servant with the five talents comes back, and what does he say to the master? Yeah, I had the five talents, and I used them wisely. Now I got ten. And the master says to the servant, man, you've done well. Good job, buddy. And then the, the second servant comes back, and he's got two talents. And he says, guess what, master? I had, two, I had two talents, and now I got four. And the master says, man, you've killed it. That's great. And then the master looks at the servant that's got the one talent. And he says, well, what did you do, sir? He said, oh, I went and buried that talent in the ground because I was afraid. And the Bible says that in this parable, the master takes the talent, the one talent, and he gives it 
to the man with the ten talents because one was faithful and another was not. It's interesting that the excuse, the reason that the, the one talent guy didn't, didn't multiply or didn't use what God had given him is because he was afraid. And he was burying his talent and exposing his fear, but in reality, he should have been exposing his talent and burying his fear. Because fear oftentimes is the reason why we don't use our resources wisely. And Jesus commends the servant that stepped out on faith, and he corrects and rebukes the one that says, I'm going to just hang on to this. I'm going to bury it in the ground. I wonder how many of us today are thinking, man, do I want to be a five-servant person? Do I want to be a one, a one talent, a one talent person? Because you know what? Every person is gifted. Every person has been gifted. You know what? If it wasn't for God, you'd have zero talents. And some of us in the room got one talent. Some of us in the room got five talents. Some of us got two talents. The message of the parable of the talents is use what God has given to you. Use what God has given to you. Uh, he gives them according to abilities. They're all different. God says be faithful with what you have, not with what you don't have. And each servant had an opportunity. You know, Edge Church, we have been given a great opportunity. There is nothing so special as an opportunity. We've been given great opportunity. Great opportunity. Let's... Let's seize the moment and let's seize the opportunity to do something that is great for God. So generous people feel fear, but they take steps of faith anyway. Do you know this? A lot of times we think that people who are generous don't feel fear. Everybody feels fear when it comes to being generous. Every person says, man, if I give this, am I going to have enough at the end of the month? But you know what? The difference between people of faith and people that are dominated by fear is that the people that are filled with faith have fear, but they do it anyway. That's the difference. That's the difference. Well, when we give generously, this is what happens. Both of us grew up Catholic. I maybe just loved God because my family loved God. You know, I was more, I didn't really know much. I was really angry with God for a long time. Um, growing up I had, by the time I was 15, I had 15 surgeries. Um, and so I was always, why God, why me? You know, I kind of drew away from God and thought that I was like too cool for God. You know, I just kind of did my own thing, didn't need Him. We were married for a couple years and um, we found out we had some health problems. Jeff was facing um, another surgery, and then we found out um, as well that we could not have kids. Um, we started buying things to kind of fill the hole. One day we were on the road to Target, and we happened to see a sign on the side of the road that said when the services were, and um, Jeff was driving, and I was like, pull over, we have to go to that church. And I think we just felt really comfortable there from the beginning because um, whether it was with the name tags or just the, the friendly atmosphere, everyone wanted to know your name and introduce themselves as well. Um, but Pastor Ryan uh, delivered a message about Sarah and Abraham. And when he was talking about God's promises and how God never um, you know, goes back on a promise, he had told them that they were going to have kids, we, we knew that there was going to be some way for us to have a family. Yeah. Um, and so that gave us a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. Pastor Ryan, I feel like spoke directly to us with whatever he was talking about. That's when we both accepted Christ into our life was that yeah. service. Jeff was the one that wanted to get baptized at first and I was um, a little bit more nervous. I thought um, that this is what I was supposed to be doing at this moment and I remember starting to cry because I was like oh my gosh this is so great you know like just both of us um, having this moment together that was that was really great. Since we accepted Christ it, it's, it hasn't always been easy. Um, you know, and we still had some issues with, with spending when we first, you know, were new believers. Um, and we were trying mm -hmm. diligently to maybe um, still have a baby by doing um, like IUI treatments. They were unsuccessful, but we had to pay for all of them out of pocket because insurance did not cover them. Well, and it was like every month that we're like, oh, we're not having a baby this month. Then it was like, 
oh, let's go out and buy something to make, you know, like there was like a hole, you know, the hole there. And so um, we, we were definitely living outside our means. Mm -hmm. And um, we knew it. And while we were out spending all this money, we, you know, we weren't tithing and giving to the church the yeah. way we should have, you know, giving our first tenth to God. Um, you we know, thought it was all ours. You know, it was absolutely. like, we're earning this all ourselves. We're the ones working. This is our money. We're going to hold on to it tight. I started the 90 day challenge after you um, started tithing. Yeah, we were living in a, in a large three bedroom house and we had a humongous backyard. We bought it because we thought we were going to fill it with kids right away. We decided to give those to God. He was like, hey Mel Mickey's, you know, <laughs> there's some things you can't have anymore. And one of them was our house. At first, you know, it was, that was really hard to deal with. We were pretty devastated. And then um, we realized like um, that wasn't in God's plan for us to be there with the way we were spending. But when we chose Jesus at the center of everything, it made it very easy to say no to a lot of the stuff that we had been doing and to like know that there was a way to turn it around. Like there were days where I would wake up and like, oh my gosh, you know, we can't do this. You know, we're, we're somewhere new, we're, we're doing all kinds of things new. And um, then, you know, Jeff would just be like, you know, let's, you know, we just need to pray. Instead of getting angry at each other about some of the habits, because we were both guilty mm -hmm. of uh, overspending and overextending ourselves, I think that while that could have torn apart some marriages, it actually, with Jesus in our marriage, helped mm -hmm. us become much, much stronger. And now, yeah. you know, I, I always tell her there's two things that I know in, in my life, and that's, you know, Jesus Christ is my number one and she's my number two. Mm -hmm. You know, that's exactly how we go. Um, and, you know, I think that that's been, what's made it easier for us in this transition mm -hmm. is, you know, that we've been so strong together. I'm constantly learning and growing. I think that the people around me um, have have stretched me to places I didn't know that I could um, go and um, have really taught me a lot. I guess the reason why I love Edge Church is because it's, it's a family. Um, from the moment we walked in, we were accepted and uh, we knew that it was a place that we could grow to call home. About that Edge Church, exciting. Yeah, you know, stories of life change like that just help put in perspective uh, why the Shake the City Project matters because it's about, it's about impacting people, it's about changing lives, it's about transforming community. And Jeff and Amanda have an amazing story, but you know what? There's dozens and dozens and dozens of people that have great stories too, and it just never stops. We know that this is just the beginning, this is not the end. and so. Let's shake the city at church. Let's shake the city. Let's shake the city by our praying. Let's shake the city by our devotion to Jesus. Let's shake the city by our giving. Let, 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 let's shake the city. Come on. Let's shake the city together at church. Let's stand together to our feet. Let's shake the city by saying we are ready for the challenge that's before us. Let's shake the city by saying nothing is impossible with God. Let's shake the city because the Bible says if we have the faith of a mustard seed, we can move a mountain. Let's shake the city. Let's shake the city. Let's shake the city.